when an object is rotating, even if it's not moving through space, it has kinetic energy. It takes work to get it up to speed. It can do work when it's reducing its speed. How can we characterize what the kinetic energy of a rotating object is? It turns out to do this, we'll need to introduce a new quantity for the rotational inertia of an object. This is the rotational analog of the mass of an object. The rotating kinetic energy of an object is given by this formula, 1 half i omega squared. This looks quite similar to saying the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. We see omega, the angular speed, is analogous to the v speed, and this i then must be the rotational analog of mass. It tells us how inertial the object is. The name we have for this is the moment of inertia, which is basically rotational inertia. It's the rotational analog of mass. What units must this be in? Well, we see that we have to get units of joules, kilogram meters per second squared, by multiplying this i, whatever it is, by omega squared. Omega is in units of per second. Omega squared must be per second squared, so i must be in units of kilogram meters squared. Let's see how this works. We'll first consider a single point particle. It'll have mass m, and it'll be rotating some distance r from the axis. I want to specify its rotational kinetic energy, 1 half i omega squared, as being the same thing as 1 half mv squared, its kinetic energy determined from its speed through space. So what then must the moment of inertia i be for this particle? Here's our system. We've got mass m rotating a distance r from the axis. So I'm going to say 1 half mv squared is 1 half i omega squared. Let's dispense with those factors of 1 half. We just have mv squared equals i omega squared. Solve for i. i then becomes mv squared over omega squared. So the v squared over omega squared simplifies as the quantity v over omega squared. Recall that v, the tangential speed, is just omega, the angular speed, times r, the radius. So we can substitute that in, and that simplifies quite nicely. Omega r over omega just becomes r. So we have i so we have, for a point particle of mass m, a distance r from the axis, the moment of inertia of m r squared. The units work out as they need to. Recall we said the units had to be kilogram meters squared. That's exactly what this will give us. So what does this formula tell us, first of all? Well, it tells us that the more mass of the object is, the greater m is, the more rotational inertia it will have. That makes perfect sense. It also says that the farther it is from the axis, the more rotational inertia it will have, which also makes sense. Well, what if your object isn't a point mass? What if your object is an extended object in three dimensions? It still has a moment of inertia. For regular shapes, the moment of inertia is rather easy to calculate. Actually determining the formula for a moment of inertia can be a sticky calculation. But in the end result, generally we come up with something that's in the form of moment of inertia i equals c m r squared, where c is some shape factor. It's a dimensionless number that's related to the shape of the object times m the mass of the object in r, usually some parameter of its size. For a round object, that's typically just the radius of the object. There's some examples in your book. Here are some other examples. Um, probably can't even see most of these, but we can see that there are different formulas for different shapes. The moment of inertia depends on where the axis of rotation is, as well as how the mass is distributed.